we destroyed Thanos. But it's not over. My work is inevitable. There will always be more to finish it. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. I had a chance to see the Marvels recently, so this will be my review of the movie. There's a bunch of stuff to talk about, a bunch of stuff in the movie they used to set up Avengers 5 Kang Dynasty, so I'll be doing a post credit scene video, later full breakdown Easter eggs after it actually comes out in theaters. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get everything. We also have the Loki Season 2 finale coming out around the same time. I'll be doing a totally separate video for that. And even though you can totally watch both of them without having to watch the other to understand them both, a lot of what the Marvel's movie is doing, for example, the Loki finale will help clarify the direction that things are headed, so they are meant to be complementary. But generally, Marvel's trying to move away from you absolutely having to watch every single thing to understand every single new thing, too. They even just unveiled, like, a whole spotlight banner for stuff that's, like, totally new that you don't have to have watched anything else to have watched. That's meant to be for the upcoming Echo series, though, so that's like a completely separate thing from the Marvel's movie or the Loki series. So for a lot of you asking the other big question, do you have to have read the comics or seen the Miss Marvel series or the WandaVision series to understand the Marvel's movie? Because both of those kind of set up what's going on with most of the characters when the movie picks up. For the most part, the answer is no. As long as you've seen the first Captain Marvel movie, the Marvel's movie does a pretty decent job of catching up all the non-Disney Plus viewers quickly at the beginning of the movie so you know who Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel is, who her family is, you learn who Monica Rambeau is. You don't have to have watched Secret Invasion to know what's going on with Nick Fury and his Saber space station during the movie. The movie kind of catches you up really quickly. But for instance, a lot of what happened at the end of Secret Invasion was meant to set up what's happening in the Marvel's movie, and obviously the WandaVision post credit scene with Monica Rambeau, and then everything during the Miss Marvel series. Like, literally the end of the Miss Marvel series is meant to happen during the events of the Marvel's movie. I think they even actually released this full clip online of what happens right after this moment. So if you go into the movie having seen all this stuff, you are rewarded just like a little bit more, like you do kind of understand the character dynamics a little bit faster. The movie is meant to be the next Marvel Phase 5 space-based movie after Guardians of the Galaxy 3, explaining how the larger Incursions storyline begins to affect the main universe, the 616 Earth, in the larger multiverse storyline as we head into Avengers 5 Kang Dynasty, the Council of Kangs gets ready to fight the new Avengers roster. Generally in the same way that like all new Marvel movies have some way of pushing towards like the next big Avengers movie. Even though Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was relatively self-contained to just Guardians stuff, there were a couple moments during the movie setting up larger events that were happening. The interesting connection, too, is that Nia DaCosta, the director of the movie, actually said that she originally pitched a version of the Marvel's movie that involved time travel and Adam Warlock, but this was long before Guardians of the Galaxy 3 came out and she knew what was going on in that movie and before she knew what was going on in the Loki series. Basically, she said exactly what you think Kevin Feige said, like, no, 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 we're already doing time travel on the Loki series, we're already doing Adam Warlock and Guardians of the Galaxy 3, you have to find some different plot. They haven't fully revealed what that version of the movie is going to look like, so if we do, I will put it in my full breakdown and Easter eggs video, or like my deleted scenes video, after the movie comes out. We already know about a couple really big deleted scenes. But a lot of this movie explains how the characters deal with what's heading up towards Avengers 5 King Dynasty, particularly the Captain Marvel character with the help of her friends, Monica Rambeau, who's kind of like her surrogate niece, even though the way that they age in the MCU is a little bit different. Like, she's aged like a normal person, so it's like two adults, even though technically she was a little kid in the last Captain Marvel movie. Captain Marvel's powers have basically slowed her aging down, so she doesn't look like she's aged a day and the addition of Miss Marvel, who's like Captain Marvel's new friend. She's meeting her for the first time during the events in this movie, but for Kamala Khan, she's been an Avengers fangirl since the Battle of New York in the first Avengers movie, and even more so during Avengers Endgame, when the final battle was made public, like the knowledge of what actually happened there, and she became a huge fangirl of Captain Marvel herself. That's basically just meant to be an adaptation of her from the comics. They've changed a couple things, and now they've actually recently changed the comics to make her a little bit more like the MCU version of Kamala Khan. Most of the time, it's the comics influencing everything that happens in these comic book movies, but every once in a while, the movies influence what happens in the comics. Mostly specific to all the X-Men changes that they made recently to her character, like she is a mutant in the MCU, kind of like Namor. 
Obviously a big part of the movie is then tying in the larger ongoing story elements with Nick Fury's Saber Space Station, what he's been doing since the events of Spider-Man No Way Home and that post credit scene. That's meant to be an adaptation of the S.W.O.R.D. space station from the comics, but they've also made some changes to that because of the way they use S.W.O.R.D. during the WandaVision series. Interestingly enough, it's meant to be one of the shortest movies that Marvel has ever done. The director, Nia DaCosta, said that it was always supposed to be super short, like they went into the movie planning for it to be super short. It's only about an hour and 45 minutes long, if you consider that to be super short. Looking at most of the Marvel movies, that is pretty short. Like, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was more like two and a half hours long, and Quantum Mania was a little over two hours. For the most part, the Marvel's movie is meant to feel like a super breezy, quick, kind of wacky adventure at times, with the three friends coming together to save the universe and the Earth. And even though I had a couple issues with the movie, like there were a few things I didn't think quite worked, generally the character work between the three mains was solid. Aman Vellani as Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, probably going to be the MVP of the movie. I think most people will agree that she's probably going to be one of the best things to come out of this movie. She had a lot of the same energy of Spider-Man during Avengers Infinity War during the movie, like the jokes that Spider-Man told in No Way Home where he was talking to the others about fighting aliens in space. Like it was a fun adventure he was happy to have had, even though he legit died during that movie. Like the whole idea is that during Infinity War, he almost died several times, then actually did die for a hot minute. Generally through the movie though, he seemed like he was having the time of his life, just happy to be on the team, becoming an Avenger, so to speak. It's kind of the same vibe with Miss Marvel. Like when they did the Miss Marvel series, they kind of designed her to be their new version of Spider Man, so to speak. Like the character who was in high school, who was a fanboy or fangirl of all this big Avengers level stuff that was happening around them. So for her, this movie is meant to be a big wish fulfillment story, like getting to meet one of your heroes and help save the universe. It'd be like you getting to live your Tumblr dream that you wrote about a couple years ago, but then it actually comes true. When I said some of the movie does get kind of wacky, silly, I think some people will have issues with that. Like, if you're not a big fan of the sillier Marvel movies, there are a lot of moments like that during this. And generally, if you did not like the first Captain Marvel movie, this is better than the first Captain Marvel movie, but it's still a lot of that same energy. So, like, this movie isn't going to completely turn you around if you're not a big fan of the Captain Marvel character. Some of the drama between Monica Rambeau and Captain Marvel at the beginning of the movie didn't quite work for me as much, but that picked up during the third act in the big final battle after they worked through all their differences. There was a lot of WandaVision that they used to explain this drama that was going on between the two characters. So if you watch that series, there's like a little bit of context for that, but it felt like it kind of dragged on the movie, especially at the beginning. Generally, the strongest parts of the movie are the first act and the third act, which is actually a big surprise for comic book movies in general. Generally, the point where a lot of these big movies tend to fall apart is the third act. Like, they have a strong story, but then they don't know quite how to land the bird, so to speak. But in the Marvels movie, it's actually the second act that's probably the slowest of the film. Like, it drags on. They have to have some creative ways to unstick the plot and just move things into the third act so the action can pick back up again. And speaking of the action, it's all pretty solid. All the fight scenes are great. Nia DaCosta, the director, said that when she was pitching for the movie, she actually used a lot of Final Fantasy Advent children for the fight scenes, the character moments. And generally, I think that it paid off. Like, she generally had the right idea. One of the other weakest parts of the movie, though, is the actual overall main plot with Darben, the Kree, her main villain plot. Generally, I think the main villain of the movie suffers from a lot of the undercooked Marvel Phase 1 or Marvel Phase 3 main villain problems that Marvel used to have. She just never quite gets to the level of, say, like, High Evolutionary got during Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Like, he's probably one of the best Marvel villains that they've done next to someone like Loki. Speaking of Loki, too, like, talking about really good Marvel villains, although Loki's kind of turned into more of a hero recently. Zawe Ashton, who plays Darben, the main villain in the movie, actually has a real-life connection with Loki. Like, she's the partner of Tom Hiddleston in real life. They literally just had a baby. So they're kind of like a full Marvel family now, in the same way that, like, Ewan McGregor just had a baby with Mary Elizabeth Winstead in real life, making them a Star Wars family. Overall, Zawe Ashton had a pretty solid performance of the material she was given. It's just that her storyline in particular was not that strong, compared to, say, like, High Evolutionary's story. Maybe that would have benefited from, like, a slightly longer movie. Usually when movies are shorter, that's what tends to suffer. Most of the talk this weekend after the movie comes out everywhere will be on the end of the movie, like the big final battle in the post credit scene. So no spoilers in this video. If you do get a chance to see the movie early, please don't post spoilers in the comments. I will do a much longer post credit scene video on Friday, like a full breakdown of all the Easter eggs in the movie on Saturday. We will talk about all that stuff. And there is a lot, a lot to talk about. They're finally doing some of the things that everybody's been waiting for them to do. 
Overall, the final act, like the big final battle, is some solid Marvel action. There were a few CG shots that were a little raw, but nothing like the issues that Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania had. In generally ranking the Marvel movies so far this year, I would say Guardians of the Galaxy 3, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse are still peak, like some of the best Marvel movies ever, not just this year. But they are like the two best big comic book movies this year by a very wide margin. The Marvel's movie is better than Quantumania, but it's nowhere near as good as, say, like Guardians or Spider-Verse, and it was better, like I said, than the first Captain Marvel movie. You can definitely tell behind the scenes Marvel's trying to address a lot of the complaints against it this past year, but because the majority of the movie was filmed and edited before the complaints really started to come down against them, there's only so much of that that they can address in post-production and reshoots once the movie is done. The music score was great, the original score, this is also a banner year for Beastie Boys in Marvel movies. Generally, the direction from Nia DaCosta was solid. She's also a noted X-Men comic book stan since she was a little kid. She even said that she pitched a Cyclops and a Storm team-up movie before Marvel hired her to direct this movie. Since I know everybody's been talking about X-Men the past few months, and so much of the trailers were hyping up X-Men related stuff, like I said, no spoilers in this video, but do stay through the credits for the mid credit scene and the post credit scenes. Next to the Loki finale, it is probably going to be the most talked about thing this weekend. There is one mid credit scene and sort of like a funny post credit scene. The one everybody's going to be talking about is technically the mid credit scene. That's meant to be very heavily plot related. The actual post credit scene is more of like a funny moment referencing things from earlier in the movie. It isn't really plot related. My full videos for both of those will post after my Loki finale video on Friday, so be sure to go see the movie as soon as you can. Everyone click here for my post credit scene video, I'll update the link as soon as I post that, and click here for my Loki finale video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.